Hi, welcome. Yeah, it's Tuesday. This is To Write and Have Written. Good evening, good morning, good midday, good whatever. And uh, yeah, I'm Laura Van Arndonk Baugh. I still don't have a catchphrase, which is going to be my catchphrase, I guess. And <laughs> we're going to talk tonight at the, about the many different mental phases of writing and creating. Uh, the ones that you are going to encounter at some point in your writing career and the ones that you are going to encounter with every single project. And we're going to talk about uh, what to do, uh, you know, how to see them coming, how to handle them and how to avoid letting them run your life to detriment uh, because they're just emotions and they're predictable emotions and we know they're just going to run through their cycle and we just need to let them do their thing while we continue to make good decisions. So with that in mind, Let's, uh, let's go ahead and hold on. Here we go. Okay. And I need to preface this with, I wrote this topic down. This topic actually went on the calendar. Oh my gosh, maybe even months ago, definitely weeks ago, possibly months ago. Uh, and I, I kept meaning to sit down and like write out notes for tonight, uh, because you know, there's a lot that could be said on this topic and I, 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 I made poor life decisions. I really thought that once I got through November and, you know, got through NaNoWriMo and got Kin and Kind put to bed as a book, uh, which it is. And in fact, kind of did a soft launch today. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I thought, oh, then I will be caught up and I will be able to sit down and, you know, write up my notes for the for the, for the show and, um, do some other projects. And I told two different people that I would beta read or edit or, or, or similarly, um, read for reviews or things for people. And, um, and yeah, no, that was, that was a terrible prediction because, uh, <laughs> I had other things going on. I'm, I'm still teaching KPA workshops and I'm teaching two different KPA series simultaneously. So I had a workshop in one state last weekend and a workshop in another state this upcoming weekend and all the homework that the students are giving me for those. And what was I thinking? Uh, so, so yeah, I'm still trying to get ahead of things after the stream tonight. I'm going to stay up very late grading homework and, and uh, writing a student assessments and all of those things. And then I will get back to more fun projects. So yeah, that's where I am. Uh, but that's why I don't have a super organized collection of notes to just go through boom, 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 boom tonight. Uh, and so we're going to be kind of taking this a little bit as we, as we go, uh, because I didn't write a lot of notes, but I know what I want to talk about. And I'm definitely open for discussion. Like you guys know the drill, everything is open for discussion here. Uh, but, but I, I do, do want to talk about these because some of these people talk about on the regular and some of them I really haven't seen discussed a lot in the writing community and they're real and we need to know what to do with them. So, okay. <laughs> Grace says you're a pantser. You'll do fine. Yeah, that's, you're, you're not wrong. Okay. <laughs> also, I used to compete in improv speeches, uh, in high school. So there we go. Uh, yay speech team. Okay. Um, so I guess the short version of this is we want to know the different phases that, are normal and expected uh, in a writing project or in a writing career so that they don't unseat you. Even good ones can let you get, oh wow, that's a lot, a lot of really happy owls going on in the background. Hold on guys, simmer down. Um, <laughs> so um, there's a, there's um, a lot of any, anything that's, that's, too, too much emotion that can overwhelm you, can throw you off your groove and, you know, not just distress, but you stress as well. And so we want to just, I'm not saying we shouldn't be emotional. We shouldn't have happy and all of those things. That is definitely not the take home message here, but I do want you to know how to handle it. I want you to know what's coming and I want you to know, you know, what's normal and, and how to handle it. So, okay. So let's start with a really fun one that everybody has experienced and that is shiny new project. <laughs> so I have, uh, I have a new idea. I'm about to launch into a new project and, and we, we all have experienced this and we see this all the time. I have a new idea. 
maybe that's all I have. Maybe I don't have characters. Maybe I don't have a plot. Maybe I don't have anything more than a premise. And maybe I just have a hint of a premise, but I have a new idea and it's the best thing ever. And so I'm going to focus on this and get started. This is exciting and it's exciting um, for a lot of good reasons and it is legitimately exciting and you should have a good time with it. And nothing I'm about to say is going to change the fact that you should be getting have a good time with it. Grace says shiny phase is awesome. Yes, exactly. Shiny phase is really, really fun. Um, that's actually the problem is that shiny phase is awesome and really, really fun. And there's a whole bunch of neurochemistry that goes into this, but the short version is shiny phase is awesome and really, really fun. So when we start getting into I have a premise and we, and we start trying to turn that into, I have a story. It becomes unawesome and unfun pretty quickly because instead of being just a shiny idea and while it is vague, okay, when it's a premise, even if you have a relatively detailed idea, it's still an idea, right? You have a relatively detailed idea that you can probably explain in a paragraph or two. When you try to turn that into a novel, it's going to take a lot more fleshing out. That's fine. That's how, that, that's all good. That that's how the system works, right? The the problem is when I start having to take translate that idea into an actual story. While it's vague, everything that's unclear is perfect. When we start putting it into a rough draft form and rough drafts are by the way awful, that is why they are called rough drafts. They are not a finished product, which is why they are called first drafts. Uh then um, the, then the, the, it starts being unperfect, like a lot in, in a hurry. Um, yeah, Grace says one hour of snowflake or bits of snowflake. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, the shiny phase is great. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, but then as soon as we start having to realize, oh, darn it, that doesn't actually work because if he did this and she does that and that kind of thing, oh, oh, what, I got to fix this timeline issue or whatever. And it starts feeling less awesome. This is where your brain starts, you know, okay, now it becomes work. <laughs> and I, this is also a good phase, like um, rough drafts can be really, really fun as well. But it also starts feeling a lot more like work. Where people get into trouble is they're struggling because their rough draft is hard, and it's ugly because it's a rough draft. And they get a new idea and new idea is shiny and awesome. And so it's really easy to get sucked out of my rough draft isn't going well. I'm having to actually work at it. Ooh, shiny new idea that is vague and therefore is perfect. And, and so we just kind of move on to new idea and abandon old idea. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on the limbs here. And this is, this is the tough love part of the show. All right. Um, Oh, I'm a writer. I've written lots of stories. I've written, you know, 20, 25, you know, 5, 10, 25 uh, different stories. I just haven't finished them. I just start one and then I move to the next one and then I move to the next one and then I move to the next one. I'm going to be a little bit mean here and say, no, you haven't written 25 stories. Stories have beginning, middles, and ends. That is the definition of a story. You have written 25 beginnings. You have not written 25 stories. Now, Nobody actually cares. Like there's not a badge police that, you know, counts how many stories you've actually written. So you get to be a writer or, you know, whatever that is. The point is you're not going to improve at writing stories while you are not writing stories. If you want to improve at writing stories, you need to write stories, which means beginning, middles, and ends. So enjoy shiny phase. Oh my gosh. Rough drafts are rough. First drafts are only the first of many iterations. They're going to be hard. We need shiny, shiny joy to power us through that. But just be aware of the, the lure of all that brain chemistry wanting to go off again uh, when you get a new idea. And it might want to tempt you away from your current project. And oh, uh, yeah, I am definitely a person who works on multiple projects at once. So that's not what I'm saying. Like you, you can never start something new until you finish the previous one. I'm just saying, make some educated choices on why are you quitting the, pre the, the current project? Are you continuing the current project? 
I would, do you know that you're lying to yourself about ever coming back to that career project? Um, yeah, all of these things, you know, look at this from a big picture perspective, not just we endorphins perspective. Okay. Grace says me with the Scarlet Pimpernel in space. That is very shiny. And that is also all I have. Yeah, that's exactly. It's so easy to do that, which by the way, that is an awesome premise. And, uh, you should probably sit down and finish that just saying, uh, but yeah, that it, it's so easy to get caught in. I have an awesome premise. And as soon as I start putting it down on paper, it's going to be less awesome because it's moving from shiny, shiny premise to horrible rough draft. And that is a heck of a transition. And I'm not going to lie, like it's not always fun to live through that transition. So that's why it's good to be aware of these phases and know. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's all this is. This is just an awareness talk. I'm not telling you how to live your life. Just know why you're doing what you're doing. The next one is very much related to that. And this is one I see all the freaking time. This is, uh, oh my gosh, we should just make t-shirts and hand out membership cards because <laughs> this is so, so common. And this is also very often uh, sub subtle. It's sub subconscious, I think, in a lot of writers. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize that they're experiencing this and it's really, really affecting their writing. And that is the, what if I don't do it right? Uh, question that is hanging over you because I had this super cool idea, super shiny. And then I start writing it and now it's terrible because it's not a vague, shiny idea. And now it's a rough draft and rough drafts are mm, by definition rough. And so now I, I'm not good enough to write this. Uh, it's, I'm not doing this justice. Um, somebody else has already done it. They've done it better. Somebody else could do it better. I'm looking at my rough draft and I'm looking at my favorite author's published work and they're not the same. And I'm just going to interrupt myself for a second. Of course, they're not the same. And I've vented on this on stream before, so this isn't new, but we, we, it's very easy to compare your first draft to somebody else's fifth draft with professional edits and then say, well, they're not the same, so I'm not good enough. You know what? Their first draft wasn't all shiny either, okay? Just, you cannot revise until you have something written to revise. And your story is going to need revisions, period. End of discussion. Editing is necessary, but you can't edit until it's written. So, write the thing. Okay. Uh, but it's real easy, and so people go into this glacial pace of, you know, I'm going to write three words a day. <laughs> I've been working on the same story for, it's been 82 years and you know, whatever. And, um, and, and it's because of fear. It's because you're worried that you're not going to do it right. And it's not going to be good enough. And to that, I say, yes, of course, it's not going to be good enough. That's why it's a first draft. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't expect my first draft to be good enough. And what I have found personally is the more latitude I give myself in the first draft, the better my first draft actually is because I stop hyper stressing about it and, um, turn off that editor. And that lets my subconscious do a much better job with the story. Cause my subconscious actually usually does know what it's doing. Um, and, and I know I'm going to come back and edit it. So it's okay if I just get it down on paper and it's not quite perfect because I'm going to come back to it. But then because I'm getting it down while I'm in flow and I'm really into the story itself and not stressing about, you know, was this the exact right verb <laughs> kind of thing, um, then it actually is better. And that usually is the right verb. So, uh, but even if it's not better when you just let it go, just let it go anyway. <laughs> it's a rough draft. All right. So, um, so that's where, and, and, and there are usually tells that you, I think are common, common indicators that this is what's going on. And, um, you know, I, I, I just, I just need to take the time to get it right. Or I, I'm just thinking about it a little bit. I'm going to go back and outline a couple more times. I've already outlined it three times, but I think I'm gonna need to outline it once more to make it right. Um, sometimes this will actually come across, um, not sometimes frequently. I think this is what's, uh, it comes across in the form of criticism of others. So, you know, oh, NaNoWriMo is really stupid because if you write that fast, it can't be good. Uh, so I don't write that fast. So mine's really going to be better because I've been working on the same 5,000 words for 
four years. Yeah, that, that's projecting. <laughs> that's projecting and defending. And don't worry about other people's projects. Get yours down and then you can edit it later and it's okay. Uh, so, so yeah, the what if I don't do it right is probably the one that is the most subtle and, and, and unconscious uh, of the things we're going to talk about tonight. But it definitely exists like a lot. So just be aware of it. Um, and then while you're in that stage of, you know, oh, like, okay, well, it's, it's really hard and I'm not, it's, it's not as good as I thought it was going to be. Like my idea was so great, but now my rep draft is, but oh, shiny new idea. And this is exactly what we were talking about. It's going to strike you while you are vulnerable in that. What if I don't do it right phase? So, uh, yeah, just make some educated decisions keep, write that idea down. It's not going to get lost. Okay. Write it down. You can work on it concurrently or work on it later or whatever, but just, you know, don't, don't just always start new things. Sometimes you got to finish some stuff. All right. So then we're moving on. We get a little bit deeper into the project. Let's say we're actually making good progress. We are getting rough draft. We're getting words down. And for me, this is usually somewhere depending on the project, it'll be at 30% or it'll be at 70%. It usually hits later for me. I hear from a lot of other writers that it hits earlier at the 30 to 50% mark. For me, it's usually 50 to 70%, but whatever time it comes, this is the very next, I can absolutely count on this. I know it will happen part of the project and it is the, I hate everything. Uh, and like I said, for me, usually this is 70% in and this is a stupid idea. Why did I do it? This is dumb. Like none of this is even plausible. This is terrible. Nobody would like these characters. I don't like these characters. I don't like this story. I mean, it was a nice premise, but now it's awful and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I just, I'm really glad that at this point I know it's coming. <laughs> so what I meant trucking along in my manuscript. And then I just, you know, open it up and I stare at the screen. I'm like, I hate you. I hate your mother. I hate the English language. I hate everything. I'm like, Oh, now we're here. Okay. <laughs> and, and again, it's, it's just, um, if I know that's what's going on, I just work through it. And it's so much easier to work through it now because I know it is just an emotional phase and it will be gone later. It's going to come. It's going to be there. It's going to leave. And I can just let it, you know, sit around at my desk while I work and eventually it'll go away. Um, now I have actually, I'll take, I, I, I'm open to, I'm open to some, some talk back here because I thought this was like a normal thing that humans could do, like being aware that they were having a mood that, that just is the thing that I just thought everybody knew that they were having a happy mood or a sad mood. But I was talking uh, with somebody a while back and uh, she asked something about, you know, she, she hadn't, she hadn't seen me online that day. And I was like, oh yeah, I said, I was really, I was, I was mad about some stuff. So I knew I was in a bad mood. So I didn't want to get on social media because I knew somebody would say something dumb and then I would say something mean. So I just figured it was smarter not to get on social media that day. You know, this was, guys, it's been 2020, 2021. Y'all know what I've, <laughs> you, you, you know what I feel. Um, and she said, Oh, she goes, that's really interesting that you could do that. I'm like, what, that I could choose not to get on social media. She's like, no, that you knew that you were in a mood that you might snap at somebody. And I was like, don't, doesn't everybody know when they're in a grumpy mood? Like, she's like, no, what? So I am completely boggled by this concept that people don't know they're having moods, they're just like reacting, but they don't know why. And that, I, I don't know, is that normal? Is that weird? Am I the weird one? Is that the weird? I don't understand how this works. <laughs> so um, yeah, anyway, if uh, that, that was, I, I'm totally boggled by that. Um, but yeah, if, so just be aware if you, if you are capable of recognizing that you are having a good mood or a bad mood, <laughs> please, uh, apply that knowledge in this case. And here for me, it's the, oh, I hate everything. This project is dumb. This is stupid. What was I thinking starting it? Nobody's going to like this. And, and I just know at this point it's coming 
And especially with novels, it hits even harder with a short story than with short stories. And, uh, and I just know, and then I'm like, oh, that's here now. So it just makes it, I just have to make a conscious decision to continue to work on the project despite this mood. And then eventually that mood will leave. And I just know, and it's going to hit me usually about 70% into the project occasionally earlier, but I hear from a lot of other people that it hits much earlier in the project. So, um, okay. Kate says, I don't think you're the weird one. You're not alone anyway. Okay. That's good. <laughs> I just, I was totally boggled. She's like, you know, most people don't know they're having a particular mood. They're just in it. And I'm like, that, I mean, that's honestly, that's terrifying to me that you would just be reacting because of a bunch of random chemicals in your head that mostly have to do with how recently you ate a Snickers and not know it and not know why. Like that, that's, that's, a, that's like my personal horror film right there. Anyway, um, Grace says some days I can tell some not so much, but yeah, it happens. Okay. All right. So whatever it is, if you just need to, like, if you're, if you're good at checking in or if you need to put a little post-it note on your monitor that says, is this a mood? <laughs> yes, no, <laughs> you know, whatever. Understand that, you know, it's just a mood and you can work through it. Okay. So then we worked through, uh, the, I hate everything phase. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to like it again. Um, <laughs> but Laura is good at reminding me that those stages exist. Ask me how I learned this, Kate. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm starting to, I'm starting to like this project again and it's maybe it's getting a little bit raw. I'm, I'm putting a lot of myself into it. Like, I, or maybe I've taken some risks with the storytelling. I've got something that's, um, you know, I stretched, I'm out of my comfort zone, but it's, but it's probably okay. And I kind of like how it's turning out, but it is really out of my comfort zone. And then, oh gosh, what if somebody reads it <laughs> and that hits. And then I'm like, oh yeah, that actually was the point when I wrote this. Now, let me make, let me make a real quick statement. I'm speaking as a person who is writing professionally for a career of writing. If you are a hobby writer, then great. Like that doesn't make you less of a writer. Okay. You're not a commercial writer. You're writing for yourself. That's still writing. Um, but then, you know, <laughs> it might not be true that the whole point of the enterprise was for other people to read it. You might hit, if you've been writing it for yourself and now you're considering whether or not to let other people read it, in which case you'll have a slightly different spin on this, but I just want to acknowledge that both of those places exist, uh, that where you might be viewing this mood from. Uh, but yeah, for me, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, Laura, you, you wrote this as a novel to publish and share with people. Uh, what do you mean? What if somebody reads this, <laughs> but, but you're still going to hit that point because, um, because I am always kind of trying to stretch into, you know, I just, I don't want to like stay and write the same thing every time. Right. I want to stretch a little bit on my comfort zone. I want to get better at something. I want to try new things. I want to experiment. Uh, and, and what if I experimented and then other people see it? <laughs> okay. Um, and so that's, that's a thing that, again, I just have to be aware of. Um, and then the, the one that comes close after that, and it could, might come at the same time or it might be a totally separate phase, but I think they're a little bit related, uh, which is what if it fails? So I did write this, I did stretch, I did, I, oh, and I, I thought it was really good and I'm really proud of it. And it's, I wrote it. So it's, I am not my writing. My writing is not me, but I wrote this. So it is kind of like getting naked on the page right? <laughs> because, uh, writing is intensely personal. And, and then what if I put it out there and, 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 and nobody likes it or what if they hate it, you know, and that's going to feel an awful like, like they hate me. Even if I know I am not my writing, my writing is not me, but I made this and you hate it. Or I made this and like it didn't get picked up by Oprah's book club and it didn't become a Netflix series and all of those things. Like it just didn't take off. And maybe did I have realistic or unrealistic expectations or, you know, those kinds of things. And what does failure feel like and how do I handle failure and how do I define failure? So there's a ton of things we can do to set up on how to handle what if it fails. Um, which becomes a lot less terrifying question, honestly, when we actually start putting definitions on and not just letting it be super vague and by super vague and they can now become every single monster that ever lived under our bed. Uh, but 
you know, if I, if I sit down, I'm like, okay, what are my expectations for this? <laughs> like, like, like if my only definition of success is that it becomes an Amazon prime miniseries, that's probably not a great definition of success. And I should work on that earlier. Uh, and, and do, do I expect every person ever to give it a five star rating? Cause that ain't going to happen. Um, do, do if I know I'm going to get a hate review, at what point does the hate review start to matter? Right. Cause, cause I've gotten some one star reviews that I loved guys. <laughs> a lot of it is all about perspective. Um, so yeah. So, you know, again, it's just knowing that these things are going to come so you can have a little bit of, uh, of prep time so that when, when your brain does say, Hey, Laura, what if it fails? You can say, well, what do you mean by fail? You know, and just, you know, having it, having it set up there. And those, uh, all of those questions and, you know, how are we defining success? How are we defining failure? All of that. Those are all very, very personal questions that there is no set state of responses that you should, you know, ha you know if you want to sit down and, and quantify all the things in a very orderly fashion, great, go for it. That's not me. Uh, but also if you do that, your, your answers are going to look completely different from most other people's answers because everybody gets a very, uh, personal take on this. So, and they might look very different depending on the project because I have different definitions of success and failure based on, you know, what I'm working on and what I've put into it and how I'm launching it and what kind of project it is. And is this something that can appeals to the general market or is this a super ultra niche thing? And I'm going to be thrilled if two people giggle along with me at this in joke. Okay. So all of these are real. Um, <laughs> okay. Kate, I'm so, I'm so like glad you said this because this is, uh, this is perfect. This is spot on. My definitions of success tend to collapse the moment I've seen someone else being more successful. So I think I need clearer definitions and more reminders of them. Absolutely. Yes. Like this is, and I know you, you put the smiley face on there. You were laughing, but it's also a hundred percent true that, you know, uh, I think, I think I've mentioned here before, like I was having a good day and I got on social media and, uh, one writer friend I know was in, um, entertainment weekly and the other one was announcing the TV series contract that he signed that morning. And I'm like, they're both of them on the social media in the same morning. And I'm like, fine, just going to back and play with worms over here at my desk. Right. <laughs> um, but, but also those people are working in different genres with different markets. They have different agents. They have different, like you know, all kinds of things. It's not, none of this is a fair comparison. And, uh, when we just need to, you know, some people care more about different kinds of success than other people do as well. And yeah. So, okay. <laughs> what if I put it out there and my boss's boss emails me and tell me she bought, tells me she bought a copy, right? Right. That is totally like, yeah. And, um, yeah. And I, I live in absolute terror of, you know, my mother-in-law reading my books, like terror, terror. Anyway. Um, yeah, this is, <laughs> you just have to, uh, uh, you, you just, you just, you have to, you have to find what, what it is that scares you. What is it is that excites you? And then question that a little bit, like what is actually bad about people I know buying a copy aside from the fact that I wrote it and therefore it's like being naked on the page because that is exactly how writing works. So, <laughs> okay. Um, Ooh. All right. Um, uh oh, can you guys still hear me? Maybe going to hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm getting some weird audio things going in, but we're going to assume that, okay, you can hear me. That's good. As long as you can hear me, it doesn't matter what's happening at my end. All right. And then the other phase, and this is one that I kind of discovered and I kind of poked around and I found that other people sometimes felt this way too, but nobody talked about it. And then in the last year or two, I've actually seen a few more people mention it. So hopefully uh, it will become something that gets discussed more often. And I get it as a Midwesterner, I am all over this. I totally understand where this, why we don't talk about this one. Excuse me. I personally call it post pubum depression. <laughs> I don't know if it has another name anywhere else. Uh, but that's what I have called it for myself for years, uh, which is immediately after publishing a book. And then you just feel instead of feeling thrilled and joyous and proud, you feel 
depressed and hollow and a little bit empty and a little bit disappointed and everything. And I think the reason we do not talk about this, in case it's totally a thing. Yes, absolutely. The reason we don't talk about this, at least in my case, um, it, you know, what makes sense to me is as a Midwesterner, I just accomplished a really huge thing. And then to say I'm not perfectly happy af- about it uh, reeks of ingratitude and uh, and all kinds of terrible things that we just don't do. And and so I don't want to I don't want to say, yeah, I just I published a book, but I'm not super thrilled about it. No, you have to um, you know, you're not allowed to be proud of publishing the book either, <laughs> because that's not how Midwesterners work. But we also are not allowed to be ungrateful <laughs> that we uh, uh, published the book and didn't get everything we ever wanted out of it, right? Uh, but realistically, like, and, and, and if you look again, look outside of just publishing, uh, this happens, you know, after people finish running a marathon, this happens after people finish an enormous, long-term stressful project, you know, remodeling a house or, or a huge project at work or, or whatever. Um, this happens a lot of places. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, you are bending all this energy on one specific goal and now it's gone. So all of those, you know, all of that effort is, is, has now just shifted and maybe has no place to go, or maybe you're just exhausted from getting through it or whatnot. And there's actually, I should have looked this up. Um, there's data on making a really, really hard push that you, you know, you, your classic, I I don't have any option but to keep going kind of project, you know, you're pulling all nighters, you know, you're, you're whatever. And, and then you get done and you actually get sick, not because you pulled the all nighters, but because you, your body has been in overdrive focusing, um, so much energy on staying, staying productive. And now it kind of crashes. And so your immune system drops and, and things like that. So, uh, so it, Again, it's a completely normal thing that happens in a lot of places, but we don't talk about it in publishing because I don't want to admit to that, uh, that I got my book out and now I feel a little bit flat. Again, thank God I know this is a normal thing for me now because now it, I just go, oh yeah, it's Thursday after a book launch and that's how this is going to be. I just go, I'm going to go drink some hot chocolate and have a snack and then I'll come back and work, right? Um, but if you don't know that's coming, it can totally broadside you. Uh, so I, you know, just putting out there that it exists and it's normal and you're not weird and you're not ungrateful. (laughs) So, um, (laughs) and Grace says normal. Yes. Unless I eat and forget. Yeah. Which, um, that's exactly why I wanted to, to do this topic. And because again, I think a lot of people don't realize how normal this stuff is and, um, you know, I would actually, you know, been talking to people and they're like, oh yeah, how how you, how's such and such coming? And I'm like, yeah, I woke up this morning and hit the, I hate everything stage. And like, oh, okay. You know, like, but, but if I know that that is a stage and they know that's a stage, like, then first of all, that's a complete conversation. And secondly, like we know it's a phase. It'll be okay. It's like being hangry. It doesn't actually have to change your life. You just have to know how to have a snack and move on. (laughs) So yeah. Um, so I guess, let me just flow out. Are there uh, questions, comments? Did I forget any stages that uh, I probably should mention? Um, you know, and I'm, yeah, because I, I'm just trying to hit the, hit the highlights that I think are relatively consistent and predictable for me, but there might be more out there. Uh, and as far as how to deal with them, I think this is going to be something that's a little bit individual because you know, clearly I'm a weird person who's aware when I'm having a mood. And so I can just make choices on how to deal with that mood. Uh, but if you, I think, I think everything becomes easier if you know it's coming, right? Like, um, you know, I, there's, I'm, I'm, (laughs) I know I haven't eaten. I know I'm going to be grumpy and angry and, and all of these things. So I know I'm going to make poor decisions. So I'm going to have a snack before I go to the grocery store rather than go to the grocery store hungry, right? Like there are things we can say, I know this is going to have this effect. Therefore I will make some smart decisions on how to handle it without, uh, going to the grocery store and coming home with, you know, 900 bags of groceries and half the snack aisle (laughs) in my bags. Um, and you can do the same thing for yourself uh, in your writing career. And, you know, whether that's just needing to be aware of it and that's all you need to do, 
or if you need to consciously set up, I'm going to leave myself some reminders to happen across in my manuscript, or I'm going to put some sticky notes on my monitor, or I'm going to put up some, you know, really warm lights around my area so that I'm not having the winter blues while I'm trying to write my romance or, you know, whatever the case might be. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, I, I hope this, these, these phases, just being aware of these phases will be helpful. And again, how you deal with them is probably going to be more personal, but you can't deal with them if you don't know they exist. So that's, that was my goal for tonight. Oh, let me talk about gift miss. Let me go grab that link and throw it in the chat. So Giftmas every year uh, is a, I participate in Giftmas, which is organized by Rhonda Parrish, just through the link into the chat. And Giftmas is a fundraiser uh, with a bunch of collaborating authors that raises money for a food bank uh, in Edmonton. And uh, I've done it every year. We've done really phenomenal jobs in the, in the past years of, uh, you know, just how much money people donated and were able, how many meals people were able to provide, uh, through gift miss. So bravo readers and contributors and, and all of that. You guys are awesome. Um, so we're hoping that it'll be another good year for the food bank, uh, this year. And gift miss can take different forms. It's always, uh, it's always in a blog tour and, Sometimes uh, we'll do a blog tour and every author will provide a free short story uh, on the blog tour. Sometimes it's uh, people are writing short essays to a theme. Sometimes it's combinations of those things. Um, this year, it's something totally new and different that we have not tried before, uh, which is we are doing a continuing story. Uh, so the first person wrote uh, a, a, a beginning of a story, you know, number of paragraphs. I don't, I don't know if they know, but there was a fixed number. There was a, there was a certain amount of story and passed it to the second author and passed it to the third author, pa passed it on. And, uh, so everybody's just continuing the story. There was no planning. There was no outline. It is 100%. I read what you have written and I'm taking it in whatever direction I want to go. And I get to finish this thing. Uh, so the first, uh, the first blog post with this beginning of the story went live today so that you should be able to find this, um, at the, uh, on the link that I just did there. Oh, hi, Chris. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, it is a neat idea. I'm, I'm really like every year it's been so much fun to do, uh, to do gift miss stuff and, and see the, see the responses there. Um, but yeah, this continuing story, um, and there's like an actual, what is, oh, Exquisite Corpse. Exquisite Corpse is the actual name for this kind of thing, which um, has to do with one of the first times it was done in a semi-professional context and the story that came out of it. But it just sounds really fun to say, hey guys, you want to do an Exquisite course, Corpse for Giftmas? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, it's, that's, the, that's the passing the story on. Um, but yeah, and I just, you know, the first part of the story went live today. And I just got the story to finish for my blog post last night. So, uh, so I'm, one of the things I need to do tonight is finish that story. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's great fun because again, it's going live as, and it's just rippling out and there's no planning. There's no, you'll just have to stay tuned, see how it comes out. So, but you can go ahead and, uh, uh, what am I saying? Uh, the donations are open now. Please, please make a donation and enjoy the story. And uh, you can follow the link uh, right there. And it's, it's really cool because, again, because of the way food banks work and the way that they can leverage bulk buying, um, you can get a massive amount of uh, meals, massive number of meals for even relatively small, do small donations. It's far more efficient than donating food directly because of the way that they can leverage bulk buying. So that's it. And then next week... Uh, here on the stream, we're going to be doing something pretty cool. Uh, Rhonda Parrish, who is the editor who organizes Giftmas each, each year. And uh, Rhonda has edited quite a few anthologies that I have been in. Um, so we've known each other for uh, a number of years. And we are going to be doing live editing here on the stream, which is going to be crazy. Uh, <laughs> so if you've heard me talk about, I really, really don't like to write live on stream because I, I can't stand that, that looking over my shoulder feeling as people seeing me floundering and everything. And it's, it's, I know what's in my head. Like I know nobody's actually 
sitting there laughing and throwing popcorn because I'm trying to decide what verb to use. I know it's in my head, but the point is it is in my head. And that was actually the whole point of tonight is just being aware. So there we are. Um, and, but Rhonda and I talked and we want to do a live editing session. So we're going to exchange some things and, uh, and then edit work live on stream, which is not going to be at all crazy. So definitely bring your popcorn for that. Uh, and we, I don't know, we we'll probably give a, give away a few things and stuff too. I don't know. We'll make it, we'll make a night of it. It'll be fun. Um, <laughs> oh, hi, Adam. Yeah. Yeah. Live editing sounds interesting. And again, Rhonda's been a, um, pro editor for, I don't know, a long time. Uh, like she's, she's run a magazine. She's, uh, been, you know, editing at a number of different publishing houses. And so, so it's going to be a, if nothing else, it would be a great insight to how does the editing process work and what are editors looking for when you're sending work in for say an anthology or such. Um, and if you guys have been around, um, on the stream for a while, like Rhonda was on my charity stream last year and we talked about, you know, what, how to catch your attention, attention with submissions and things. Uh, so, um, the, it'll, it'll be, it'll be fun. Um, I'm actually looking forward to it. I think it'll be a really good time. Uh, but just, uh, you know, come back next Tuesday and we'll get to see that going down live. So yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions or comments on anything we've been doing tonight? Cause, uh, we actually have a few minutes left and if not, we'll wrap early because as I said, I didn't write notes for tonight. Wee. <laughs> this is, yes, I am a pantser. Why do you ask? <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, I'm also going to like choke live on stream. All right. Um, I feel like there was something else I wanted to tell you as well. Wonder what this. Oh, I should probably mention. I did mention I did a soft launch of uh, my book today. So, Kin and Kind, number four in the Shard of Elan series, plus a couple of you know side stories and a prequel and other random stuff. But number four of the main large novels, large, large novels, fat boys, epic fantasy. Uh, and I'm so I'm experimenting a little bit, and because this is the uh, the, the, the writing side of things, the author side of things, I will happily tell you what I'm experimenting with. So last week, um, I got, gave my patrons, uh, my patrons on, on Patreon, uh, advanced access to the story. So everybody at a certain tier or above just got the ebook in their library. Everybody's got a running library, um, through my, through my Patreon. And if you were not at that tier level, you got the super, super secret link to go ahead and buy an advanced copy, uh, that, um, you know, if your tier was below the, the, the price of the book. Um, and so then the, the pe some people started reading it right away. Some people chose to wait because they want to hold out for the paperback. Hey, that's their prerogative. Uh, some people started reading it right away. Some people finished it already. <laughs> so, uh, so that was fun. So I wanted to throw them a little perk for being, uh, being a patron. And then originally the pre-order was supposed to go live on December the 25th. But since I actually got the, the book done, like, like the, the layout was finished, the proofing was finished, all the things. I was like, okay, let's just go. So, uh, so I moved the, the date up because it was set on pre-order. I can't just magically poof. And now it's released. I had to just move the pre-order date up and wait for it to push, push through. So, so it's a very, very soft launch because it's, uh, instead of being at 12.01 AM on this day, uh, now it's rolling out as the stores update. And so, uh, it should be out. I'm, I'm expecting everybody will have it by this weekend. Uh, and if, uh, if that's not the case, then, then be a little bit patient or, uh, it's actually for sale direct on my website. So, uh, so people were able to get it for immediate download, uh, if they had not pre-ordered and wanted it right away or something. So, so that's something I'm experimenting with and I'm just, you know, again, just sharing what I'm trying and we'll let you know how it works. Um, so, eh. <laughs> so, okay. Um, yeah. And then if there are no other questions, oh, what am I doing? Oh, I just told you what we're doing next week. What am I doing after that? I wanted to, um, get back up. Um, oh, I actually don't have if anybody has a request, 
because I just pulled up my calendar on the 21st, which is our traditional learn with me theme. And I actually don't have a topic written down for that. So if anybody has requests, let me know and we'll do a learn with me then. So you can feel free to ping me with that. All right. Well, that is it. And I would love to hang out and actually just do some work on stream with people, hang out a little bit, but I am, as I said at the top of the hour, buried and I need to go do some heavy, heavy lifting. Uh, and I probably shouldn't be grading student homework and stuff live on stream. Doesn't, doesn't seem like a great plan. So we're going to wrap that here, but Hey, I'm so glad Chris and Adam and, uh, Grace and Kate. And did I get it? Did I miss anybody? I don't remember, but I, I definitely saw you guys in the chat. Um, and thanks for stopping by. Yeah, Adam, thanks. I'm glad you caught the end. <laughs> and we have, we have replay for this, but yeah, you know, stop by when you can. I know, especially, um, you and Grace and people, uh, hanging out in very different time zones. I really appreciate when you are able to make it. That's pretty cool. So, all right, well, that is it. You guys have a fantastic week. Go create something amazing. And then I will see you next week when I will be eviscerated live on stream for your education and edification. All right, everybody take care. Have an awesome night. Bye.